Welcome to the Business of Being Healthy, where we are passionate about treating our health as good as we treat our wealth. Shelly Bryan here, and I am obsessed with sharing real life experiences and wisdom to help save you time, heartache, and money as you continue to grow personally and professionally. Twice a week, we push aside that BS to take massive intentional action. And I promise by tuning in, you will receive the straightforward talk you've been waiting for, filled with actionable steps that will inspire you to achieve the health and wealth you desire while you are building your empire. Welcome back to another episode here on the Business of Being Healthy. Shelly here, but I got to tell you, this guest that I have on is going to be a treat for all of us. And Stacy and I met um, because I cyberstalked her on Instagram, but ultimately I saw that a lot of our values aligned. She is a mom, she's a multi-passionate entrepreneur, and she grew and sold her first seven-figure business by the time she was 35, raising her girls. So she prides herself on not only like the experience of growing the business, but also the thousands of businesses that she's helped in the last 15 years. And just even the tiny little conversation that we had before we jumped into recording this today, I know this conversation is going to be fire. And we are going to talk about a lot of different areas, whether it is life, business, uh, numbers and accounting. Okay. I know we all need help there. Um, But more often than not, we are going to be talking about wisdom and shared so that she can help you um, and me learn more. So Stacy Miller, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, Shelly, I'm so excited. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Stacy, let's dive in because I feel like you're going to have a really unique perspective. And one of the topics I definitely want to talk about is scaling. Uh, and I know that you have a lot of experience personally, but also helping other businesses as well. But before we get into that, can you share a little bit about kind of your journey? Because I feel like this is something that we need to share more, how you were working for someone else, you left, you started your business, you sold it, and here you are to your next one. So often we can feel like, oh, well, this is what I went to school for. Here's my specific training. This is what I need to do for the rest of my life. So if you could share a little bit about that, because I think it is truly an inspiring story. Oh, this is fun. Okay. I grew up in the prairie provinces of Canada and I had no desire to be a business owner. It was not anything on my radar. I worked with businesses for a number of years as an accountant, but I really dove into entrepreneurship when I just, like many people, just got tired of like that frustration. Like I just, I want to do a better, people deserve better. I can do better for my family. I can do better for our customers all at the same time. And the frustration hit the breaking point. So I said, that's it. I'm going to do this. And it, it's been a whole journey since there. The best part is I went to business school. I was a CPA, gave up my designation. It's a whole nother story. But I went to business school and I actually had zero idea how to run a business. They teach you pieces of a business, especially if you're going to go work for like a Fortune 500. They absolutely Mm -hmm. do not teach you enough to run a small business. So like everybody else, I dove into learning about it, but it really intrigued me and like wanted to learn all the pieces and just this quest of doing better, whether it was for my team or our customers and for my family all along, just had me making these constant improvements. And that's what I love to share with people now of like, here's how I got my way to that 1%, the women who make a million dollars a year in their business. And then this is like my now journey of I exited that business and how I help people. Yeah, no, I love that. And that that's a, the main takeaway is that I, I feel like sometimes we can get that training or be in that career for so long where we feel like it's almost like we're betraying ourselves or we're betraying our like past self. It's like we, we invested not only money, right, for these different degrees or trainings, but it's like we invested time and a lot of time and it can be fearful to leave that. And so maybe just even like, that breaking point of you had enough and you had to leave, you know, what was that like for you? So there's so many of those parts, like the breaking point when I left corporate and went into (laughs) running my business was absolutely about doing better for other people. 
was like, I saw how clients like didn't get information and we weren't supporting them in their business. So it was like that breaking point. Um, then I had this seven figure business that really from the outside provided it all to me that we were making tons of money, having impact. We were giving hundreds of thousands of dollars back to the community. Like customers were raving and I wanted out. Um, for me, that was a very personal decision of like, I don't feel like I can show up at my best doing taxes because I had an accounting firm. So I had to do taxes. And as a CPA, you have to sign off on a lot of things and like staying up to date and the requirements of that business. I was like, I can't do that well. And then also pour into businesses in the way I want to. And again, I hit a breaking point of like, that's it. Like I, I have to do what's for the greater good, I guess. Right. And where my heart lies. Um, I could see the sense of burnout, even though I wasn't working a lot of hours, I was you know, making money, having lots of vacation. But when you're misaligned with the work that you're doing, that was a breaking point. And then last week I sent my accounting designation back, which is like so fresh to me, but I really looked at it and I'm like, man, there, I have to put in to keep this designation. I have to put in all these like tax hours and like keep up to date on all these things. And it was like a distraction from what I'm supposed, what I know on my heart I'm supposed to be doing right now. And that is helping people get out of the small business struggle and more onto like less surviving, more thriving. And my accounting designation isn't supporting that. So that was definitely a scary moment of the, you know, tens of thousands of dollars uh, invested and the countless hours. But let me tell you, that is a strength. If you can see past, um, there's like a whole theory on your mindset of what you've invested into something and how it's worth more than maybe what it is. And if you can see that objectively, like that is a skill. I would also say that is a really good skill for anybody listening who's considering like selling a business because oftentimes we like overvalue things. We're like, I put so much effort into this and then somebody may not value it the same buying it. Um, so that's that's something that invest in. I know you've shared a very similar experience, Shelly, right? What what aligns with your lifestyle? Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with that. And I think, you know, first I just, before we move on, just want to acknowledge you really quick because that takes a lot of bravery, right? It takes a lot of bravery and a lot of like belief in yourself to be able to like not only walk away from like your cushy job. And I, I say cushy, like your job, yeah. right? Where you have a paycheck, you're, you're working, you're contributing, walk away from that, then build another business and then sell that. Like that takes a lot of bravery. And I think that's one skill like that gets overlooked because so often we can be like, oh, well, let me go get this training. Let me go buy this course. Let me go hire this mentor. Let me join this mastermind. Let me do all this. When it's like sometimes scale it back, pull it back. And actually like, what, what am I missing right now? And, and sometimes that's confidence, you know, and the fact that you were able to do that a few times, did you notice like a confidence maybe change from the time you left your job to the time you sold your business? Absolutely. Actually, and I think it even started before that, really, I know a lot of people don't like this, but the saying, fake it till you make it. But I had a friend who taught me that skill set when I was a very shy, very quiet, like I don't even recognize that version of me, um, nerdy girl in the back of an accounting office that wanted to just live a different life. And I started taking those risks. And by taking the risks, I gained more confidence and every time I gain more confidence, I can do something a little bit bigger, a little bit scarier, like throwing away a $70,000 <laughs> degree, like, okay, who cares about this anymore? Mm -hmm. um, but you just you gain that confidence. And I think it's actually a really hard skill, because we live in a world where we're actually trying to make ourselves the utmost level of comfort. Although I've seen people cold plunge right now. So maybe we're getting back out of that. But like, we want to be warm and like the air conditioning's on heaven forbid it strays from 20 degrees in the house. And oh, sorry, I'm Canadian. <laughs> Canadian <laughs> temperatures. <laughs> but it's like, you know, like we, we want to be comfortable all of the time. Everything's about comfort. And so getting uncomfortable, I think, really, it can set you apart, but you have to, you have to start somewhere and build the skill. I love that. I love that. And that's the thing that, that, that last little bit you said, build the skill, 
build the skill of being brave and confident. That's not like something is like some people have it and some people don't. It truly wanes for everybody, regardless of their level of success, right? Like the new person versus like the seasoned billionaire, I'm sure they still get a little bit nervous when they're trying to close a deal. Like I would guarantee it, right? Because it's a new level, right? New level, new devils. Like it is what it is. And so I think that we often overlook that skill. And so I love that, you know, you are flexing that muscle now, right? As you are building this business. And, you know, what I'd love to for you to share a little bit more on is just that kind of evolution of change, right? And pivoting. Because now you are into, I, I love that just like a week ago, you were like, nope, CPA, here you go. Bye-bye, right? So you're in it right now. And that's something that I think a lot of people think like, oh, well, that was a long time ago. No, you're in it right now. And that change that you're building this business that you have right now, what are some of the, I guess, skills or non-tangible skills that you see with a lot of the business owners that you work with when it comes to scaling a business? Okay. So I have to say that the number one skill that partners with doing it scared and being able to build that confidence that is so incredibly like it enables me to act this way is my ability to be objective. It's something that I know that sets me apart, but it is something that I have honestly worked on. The my ability to look at something from the inside out and say this is working or, or this is not. This is getting me towards my goal or it's not is something that took me a long time to get past the like, am I doing it wrong? Am I not good enough? Like, why didn't I know better? It it took me getting past all of that inner voice. And I know if I can do it, anybody can. It's just something we consciously have to work at. But it that's what enabled me to get there because I was able to stop and just say like, okay, that like this isn't about me. I'm. It's not about me being good enough. It's not like CPA is emailing me. They're like, you won this early achievement award. Like you're doing great. Like why would you send this back? And I'm like, looked at it and I'm like, does this work for me or does this not? And it's not working for me. Mm-hmm. So even though I'm scared, then I have that, that I have that you know decision and kind of like that the math behind it even just to like fall back on and be like, okay, like this made sense. I weighed the pros and cons. I looked at how many hours I was investing in this that I could never get back like time with my kids. And like, this is the right decision. So that ability to be objective is something so incredibly important. Now, could could you share how you develop that skill? Because I'll share real quick and then I, I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. That's a skill that Chris and I have had to definitely work on over the years with businesses. Because just like you mentioned earlier, we would be like, we put our heart and soul into this. Not only did we invest hours and time, but like our heart into this business, it is worth this. And then we're working with, you know, an expert such as yourself. And they're like, actually, here's what the numbers show. Very objective. And we're like, okay. You know, and then just certain things in business where we've gotten hit a few times where we're like, okay, get the motion out of here, like get it out. And we had to go through those hard times to learn that skill. How can we help other people not have to go through those hard times to learn that skill of objectivity? Yeah. So I would say the number one way that I always coach my clients is always just asking if what they think to be true is actually true. So that's so easy to do. I think in like tough situations, like I was coaching a client this morning who'd received a message and she's like, why is somebody like, you know, why are they acting this way? Like, why are they making it tough on me? I'm like, are they actually making it tough on you? Do they, do they even know, you know, what you're going through? And so that level of questioning was helpful. It is harder when we're like optimistic and we have to question ourselves because we don't want to be wrong. But that is like, that's the first stage is like, do I know this to be true? And to have the time to question what I've done is I compiled a list of like these kind of questions that hit me when I hear a podcast, like, oh, I have to question myself. What what do I know to be true? What am I assuming lately? I put it on my calendar once a month and I take a couple hours where I just sit maybe maybe it's outside in the nice months here, or I sit at a cafe and I just journal about it. And I'm like, Hey, what am I assuming either in like a positive direction or not? Also, I 
really use numbers to be objective. It's like looking at your social stats. So like, let's say you're doing social media, which I'm like getting, I'm getting better at it because I'm practicing, right? So I I go and I do a reel, either it's going to do well or it's not. And you look at the numbers and you're like, that didn't get the reach. Then you look at the next one and you're like, that did. Okay, well, there's something different about it. So we're using those numbers when we're looking at social media. But I use numbers the exact same way in so many different areas of my business. One is time. Like, what are you actually putting your time to when you're time auditing? Oh, it's just always, it's always this like huge shock with clients. Like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea I was spending 70% of my time on administrative duties. Like I wondered why I wasn't making any money. It's like, okay, well, those numbers um, brought the light and the same thing financially, like either we're hitting the goal or not. And if you don't have the skill, then it's time to either invest in learning it or fractionally using somebody's advice to like dig into those numbers and be like, what do they mean? And it's like, okay, for some businesses, it it's pretty hard to make a profit when you have to hit these ginormous sales goals because your fixed expenses, like the, the overhead every month is so high. So then you get an expert who's like, looks at it and says, wow, this number is really high. Like, how do we adjust this and bring this back down? And then they can use those, but it's like the math, the math helps. I love that. And and that's one thing. I just think like numbers in general, like numbers have no emotion, right? Like we can attach a, an emotion mm-hmm. to it. it. It could be the number on the scale, right? If you're trying mm-hmm. to lose weight or gain weight, it could be the number on the size of your pants or, or your bra strap. It could be that number or it can be like your business. These are just, they have, they have no power other than what is. This is what is. Okay. But I also have to add like the other thing that has immensely helped my mindset on this is treating it like a game. Cause it's just like you said, when you said scale, it's like, yeah, like we can be like, I'm a failure. I can't do this. Or we can look at it and be like, huh, like what did, what button didn't I push? Right. What did I get the order wrong? Like, did I eat, you know, was it eating or was it the exercise? You start looking at the components and you're like, okay, what was it? But treating it sort of like a game or a puzzle, like how do I figure this out? the same thing with different areas of your business where you can use those numbers to kind of look and be like, okay, where'd this calculation go wrong? Or like, why didn't I hit my goal? And using it as a learning opportunity instead of a judgment. Because guys, like we can judge ourselves all day. We can have other other people are probably going to judge us. Maybe we know about it. Maybe we don't. But like, does that get you any further ahead? Like, why are we wasting our time on it? Mm -hmm. Right? Judging didn't and and shaming yourself, I guess, ultimately hasn't gotten you any closer to your goal. So let's give that up because our goal has an impact on the world. Leave shaming behind and let's just get down to business of changing lives. And and that could be changing your life and like the life of those that you care most about, right? Like your family. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the one thing with number and, and I had worked in the medical industry for so long. So I worked with, um, you know, medical thought leaders throughout the world and they would evaluate like studies, right? For like different medications or treatments. And it it's very much black and white. And depending upon like the overall uh, design of the study, just like how blind it was to the investigators, it, it truly just pulls the emotion out. And so I think one thing that has definitely helped me is like using those numbers. But also when I feel myself get like heated, I'll be like, what is triggering me? Like, what is triggering me? And to your point exactly, Stacy, is like, what judgment do I have on me that I'm letting this number define how I feel? And it's like, once you start kind of asking yourself those questions, you can uncover where it's it's triggering you, it's getting an emotional response so that you can not like berate yourself, but be like, wow, this is an area I need to focus on. This is an area where, like you said, go to the coffee shop, sit outside, journal once a month and be like, hey, this kind of hit me a few times when I reviewed my numbers with Stacy. this hit me, you know? And that's one thing that I want to uh, ask you next is with business owners, because I'll raise my hand myself, is like knowing your numbers. How many business owners would you say like know their biz- know their numbers really well and how to use them? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like 2%. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fair. And this, this is just real. This is just real. So 2%. Like, 
Chris Harder's in my world is Chris Harder. <laughs> like I don't know all the people that I know. No, I'm just kidding. There's there's a couple people, but I find that um, the interesting part is that they tend to be further along in business. Mm. And I tend to find people are like, you know, six, seven years in, and then they come to me and they're like, oh, I, everything changed when I started looking at my numbers. It's like we are determined to fail until we finally are like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so I just want to take like, A, the shame away from it. Like we weren't taught to do that. Many of us, like we're not in that field. I don't know why we think we have to learn it instead of just hiring it out to somebody. Like I, I do not understand macros. I do not understand, like, I don't even understand carbs, but like you tell me what to eat and I'm happy to follow along with a plan you provide me. I actually don't want to know what my doctor knows when I do learn things that doctors know is like <laughs> taking up brain space that I'm like, I know too much now I'm dangerous. Mm. So <laughs> it's like, why do we think we have to do it all ourselves? And then also like the numbers change everything. I have like thousands of people who've, who've literally said that to me is like, this changed everything. As soon as I started looking at it, you, there's a reason every fortune 500 company has to disclose numbers. We would never invest in a company. So why are we investing our own time and our own money without looking at the numbers. Mm, what a great analogy. What a great analogy. And, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm in that category, Chris, he is like pure, you and Chris could have a wonderful numbers conversation and it would be fantastic. Me. I'm like, just give me the bottom line. Just, just get to the point. Give me the bottom line. Tell me what we need to do to your point, right. On the health side, on the business side, when it came to numbers, I was like, just tell me what we need to do. What number do we need to adjust? I will work on creating the systems or the processes to make that happen. Now, um, I, I will say this and share this in a franchise that Chris and I, really, it was me, my investment that we ended up having to shut down. Long story, fraud, misrepresentation, all this good stuff. But ultimately, Chris came to me because I was trying to make it work. <clears throat> and anyone that's listening in right now, have you ever had a business that you are trying your hardest to make work and then someone puts the numbers in front of you. And if you haven't, I highly suggest you get somebody. Chris put the numbers down in front of me and said, Shelly, it's done. And we shut it down. And I would have kept going because I wasn't going to give up. And shutting it down, I had to realize was not giving up. It was making a good business decision. How often do you think and how can we help more business owners? Like, I wish I would have listened to him five months prior. What, what do you think is, because I have an idea, but what do you think in your experience with everyone that you've worked with is that, that like differentiating of like not listening, not listening to the numbers? Okay. I have to tell you this story because I actually did work with a client and I don't ever tell this story because people are like, they all want to win. We all go to into business to win. We don't go into business to close it. Of course. But I've worked with a couple businesses in the last year who I've worked with for, for like 10 years and they closed and it was a huge win for them. Okay. Like a huge win. They walked away with money. They walked away with great relationships intact still with all their vendors, with, you know, like their landlord. And they were just like, Hey, the energy that I'm putting into this is not paying back. And Based on certain conditions for us locally, it was like it, we live pretty remotely and there's a lot of challenges uh, with hiring team members. And it's like, it, it's just like not worth the effort. And so they were able to walk away. And I just think like, that is a huge win. That being said, like they were on top of their numbers. We worked together to stay on top of that and like work through that situation. So knowing those numbers can actually, the sooner that they get in front of you, especially if it's tough, like this is how I see it. Business owners are like, okay, it's tough. I'm going to go out and make a whole bunch of money. And they try that for like a couple of weeks. And it's like, hasn't turned around yet because most businesses like your sales efforts are what, like six weeks to six months lag time. So mm -hmm. they try it for a couple of weeks. It doesn't work. And then they're like, okay, that's it. I'm cutting expenses. And then they go and they cut expenses and then it still hasn't turned around. And they're like back to revenue. And then it's like, okay, that's it. I want out. And imagine if when the first time that it got tough, instead of panicking, they're like, let's look at this as a whole. Let's cut some expenses where we can. Let's really know where we're going to focus those sales efforts, not just like, let's put up a radio ad and nobody's listening to radio anymore, right? So like, let's really get focused on what it is we're going to sell and go hard on that. 
and have those numbers dialed in, then you know fairly quickly, like, if this is working or it's not, the marketing efforts start turning over, you're getting more followers, you're getting a little bit more sales, maybe it's not up to where you want, but you can see if it's working or it's not. That works well. Or you very quickly can say, let's shut this down before we lose more. Because there, the reality is, is things change, just like Blockbuster. Blockbuster, you know, if you're like, no, nah, I'm not into like this whole like electronic, you know, Netflix thing, this is too much work for me. I don't want to do it. Let's close. They could have saved a lot of money if they had made that decision when they saw the writing on the wall. So that's where I see business owners needing that information sooner, mm. but usually where they don't. It's like, if we could just look at the numbers sooner, you can make decisions that are just more, more peaceful, you know, like I'm happy with this. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it, it's, we have a, we often have a time, right? Like we think like, oh, this is our baby. This is, this is us. This is a reflection of us and asking for help or looking at the numbers like that might reveal something I don't want to see. And when it's uncomfortable, when that feeling is uncomfortable, that's when you need to do it most. You know, I heard this recently is that when you have a choice between a hard decision or an easy decision, you always make the hard decision because if the, if, if it was, if the easy one was the right decision, you would have already made it. So making the hard decision and getting over to like, look at your numbers is so powerful. Now, one thing I'd love for you to share is someone that can, is, go ahead. Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. When we avoid those hard decisions, I also think we're just making them harder later. Like we're just <sighs> postponing it. There's no actual getting out of the hard, the hard decisions. Okay. Like it's just postponing it. It's going to uh, become hard at some point. It it became a lot harder and cost me a lot more money not making the hard decision up front with that franchise. Um, so I want to kind of transition for a second because I know that we have a lot of listeners that are still, you know, maybe climbing that corporate ladder, which I get it. I did it for almost 18 years too. And they're thinking like, okay, do I start a side hustle? Do I start, do I just like shut her down and like go start the business? I've always had focused on like my heart. If you were helping or mentoring someone that is in that transition period, what are a few of like numbers driven things that they can use to kind of maybe make that transition a little bit easier and almost set themselves up for success, especially when it comes to numbers in managing a new business. Yeah. So I have these five pillars that I look at, especially for somebody who's like a solopreneur um, and early on in business. And a couple of those pillars are time and then like how much money we personally need to be making. And those two pillars really stand out for me when I'm helping people make decisions of like, do I leave my full-time job? Do I go all in? There's so many layers to that conversation, but it is one, are you at your, at your capacity for time and do you have an ability to hire anything else out? So like, you know, we're looking at it and we're like, okay, well, we've got 20 hours a week side hustle of, of working this business. And then we're tapped and then we're like, okay, well, maybe if I hired somebody, like I can buy myself back this much time. And there's comes a point where it's like, we're so busy managing people and just doing the work that it's like, this doesn't work anymore. Mm. So the time piece is important, but then also looking at the money, like how far off are we? Like, do you need the salary to live off of? And if you do, how far off are you with your business? to replacing that salary. I want to like my, I'm pretty risk adverse. I want to get as close as possible to replacing that salary or knowing it's a sure thing. Um, knowing I have the runway, like maybe a couple months of like, okay, like for sure I can do this. If I had a couple more hours a week to put into the business, this would be a no brainer. Um, and then maybe having like a line of credit or something to fall back on if for some reason, like it takes a month or two longer, but, uh, and I always tell people like plan for it to take longer than what you think it's going to take, but that's how I approach it. The other thing is, I think it's really important that we address like, just like in, in the fitness world where it's like everybody's body works so differently, everybody's mind works so differently. So when it comes to numbers, 
I really tailor like my advice to who I'm talking to because there are some people that if they have the cushy job and it's like it's paying the bills and like whatever, they're not going to take the leap and they're not going to do the hard work. They know themselves. Okay. This is not me casting a judgment on them. They just know if the pressure is not there, they're not going to do the work. They need the pressure. I had a conversation with um, a client this morning about this where she's like, man, like I had too much spare time in my calendar today. Like I just, I need the, I need the pressure. And so so if that's the way you are, then maybe making a leap earlier is a good thing for you. There's also mm. others that it's like that throws our nervous system out of whack. It's like all this stress, like I have to get, like you get into scarcity because you're like, I'm going to have to pay the bills. Like, how do I do this? It's like, whoa, that was that is not a good decision. Yeah. Do not make the leap until the last minute. So knowing yourself, which I would also say is like so much related to like I'm not talking numbers anymore, but like your nervous system and your body and knowing how your mind and, and your body work in different situations is like the ultimate game changer. It was, it was a game changer for me growing my business. And um, if you can tell that and see the way that you operate under certain decisions, then you'll know which of those two options I just gave you is right for you. I, I really love that. And, and thank you for sharing. Now, you had mentioned, you go, I'm really risk adverse. Do you yeah. help or, or have you helped any clients or any just friends, mentors, colleagues understand their level of risk? You know, this was something when I was a financial advisor back in the day, this was almost like the first conversation I would have with my prospects was understanding their risk you know, abilities, right? Whether they are completely risk adverse and or willing to take on the risk developed how we diversified and the investments that we chose. And it's, it's like something that we don't think about. We may act on, but we don't acknowledge it. How have you helped, you know, clients kind of understand that, that risk adversity or, or a uh, desire to taste, take risk? Yeah. So it's usually the conversations. It's not just like a number of being like, well, does it like, yes or no. It's more of a what feels good and understanding most of the time we have like a gut reaction in our body or our minds start racing at a certain point of learning that comfortability. I will say that anybody who is on the like high end of risk, I, pr I kind of just self-select out of working with that mm. because I take a high level of responsibility for the people that I work with. And because my, um, I guess I wouldn't even say that I'm highly risk adverse. I do take risks, but I love to calculate them out when we're like almost at the point of gambling and like throwing it all on black. I'm like, yeah, like <laughs> I I'm probably not here for it, but what I love to do is like take a little bit of the pie and throw it all on black. Right. Mm -hmm. But I know I can come back from it. So I self-select out of these situations that are like way too risky for me to be like, oh, we're here for the long run. Um, and on the other side of things, when people are so beyond risk, I feel like I don't usually see them in entrepreneurship just because they don't, they are so against risk that they just, they don't like that idea anyways. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, they may have created like a job for themselves where they're like, I love this hobby. I love doing it on the side. It's done through a business, but they're really doing it in a way where it's like, they're providing themselves a little bit income, but they're not looking to scale. It's like, they already have those telltale traits of like, yeah, I'm not really into that. They're not looking for what I'm offering. Does that make sense? Absolutely. But it's in the conversations of, of how we learn that. Like, what do you want to do next? It's like, oh, I'm good. Like, oh, okay. You probably have like no risk tolerance. Like mm -hmm. that, that, and that's okay. That that's just knowing yourself. I don't think we all have to scale a billion dollar business. No. And, and I think I've literally Stacy had this conversation over the last week, several times. And, and even Chris and I with our general contracting firm right now is like, we're at this point. It's like, do we stay here or okay, depending upon how much more business, like we will have, we will be required to scale. Is that something that we want to do? And so I think when you get to that point, then all these questions start coming up and you start designing, you know, the lifestyle that you want in the future and then kind of work backwards. 
But one thing that I know that you've had experience on, and I know that some of our listeners will relate to this because we talked about kind of the leaving the corporate into, you know, entrepreneurship, starting your own business, but then also you work with, you know, businesses that have been around and are looking to scale and you have scaled personally. So how do you, like, what are some of the key indicators that you look for when it comes to scalability and how, I know that this is more of a broad question because we're not looking at a set of numbers directly from a business, but how would you guide someone on scaling? What would be the the biggest uh, aspects to focus on first? Oh, I just love this question. Okay. I have this, uh, I may even write a book on this, but I think that there's four levels of like business and like you have to focus on certain things to get to the next level. So when you're starting out, we're like blinders on, we just want to sell, like we may not have a lot of people in our business and all of our decisions are really based around like, how do we make more money? And that's right where you need to be because when you're early in business, it's about proving that people want to buy, right? We're often like deciding, okay, we're going to price this. Like we see the competitors, we're going to price it a little bit lower and we're going to offer more. And like, that's great. But the next level of business is being able to say and test that and say like, okay, so now we've created this like awareness of who we are and what we're about. And we're a little bit different, but like, can we test that by raising our prices a bit, maybe bringing our offerings back down to like, okay, this is, this is all we're going to focus on instead of being everything for everybody. Because that first stage is more just like, you almost have a job, right? So now we're getting a little bit more serious about business. Then the next stage comes with hiring team. And I would say like scaling the alt, the, the hardest level of scaling is when you have to lose yourself as a face of a business. That is the ultimate test of like, okay, this is, this is here to last. It's not just a job. It's going to be something I can sell down the road. It's being able to lose yourself as a face. And the reason I say that is there's so many things that go into that. It's hiring a team, not just a team that can produce, but a team that manages itself. It's creating culture. It's you as a CEO also being okay with not being the one to answer every phone call, not being the one to talk to every client, not the one ringing in every sale at, at your retail um, business, right? So being able to see yourself in that business and your creative direction, it also means that because you're paying all those people that your business is financially stable enough to afford all of that. Like there's so much that goes into kind of that level of scaling, but that's the indicator is like, are you the face of the business? Because Mm -hmm. being able to step back and be like, this isn't about me. That's how businesses are sold. So like if you, if you do everything and you are every position in the business and everything relies on you, it'll never sell. So that means like, it's not really a business. It's, it's attached to you. You almost want it to be separate from you and be like, Hey, this is my great friend. I really love it, but it's not me. That is like such great advice, such great advice, because I feel like as entrepreneurs and starting businesses, you are everything. You literally are everything. But then you have to start, this has also come up recently, things that people I've been listening to, conversations that I have, where you have to make that shift. And you not being the face could mean that you need to hire two, three, four, five people to replace what you do. Like that's the thing is that you have to build the business ready to have your role be replaced. So start thinking about how you're interacting with uh, clients, the systems that you have in place, the level of leadership that you are going to bring in to take over. Definitely. These are conversations that Chris and I are having. And like I said, we had to learn the hard way. So now we're like taking our experience and and doing that, but also leaning on others that have helped others do this with their business. And I could totally see that being a um, big indicator when it comes to scaling. Okay. So the hardest part about it though, is it's like almost an ego death. Like you have to go through this level of like, I don't know, the dark Valley of like, well, who am I? And like, what, what value do I bring this business? Like if they don't need me, they're just doing all this without me. And you have to go through that questioning and then you come out the other side and you're like, oh, I actually provide a lot of value and here's how it's just that I'm not needed. I'm wanted. Right. Mm. And I, I'm sure that my girls are only five and seven, so I'm not there yet, but I'm sure parents maybe are experiencing this where, you know, kids are growing up and they don't need you anymore. So I'd imagine it's pretty much the same of like 
just the mindset and going through like, okay, who am I? And feeling confident in yourself and your abilities beyond being strapped to the business. Yeah. You know, and this is something that whether it's health or business or, you know, working on your career professionally is that mindset work, that inside, you know, internal work, that uncomfortableness. So that as you go through these different periods, these different seasons or try a new journey, new career is that when it gets tough, that your mindset is in a great frame so that you can navigate it with grace right? It might not always be pretty, but navigating with grace. And so doing a lot of the, um, extra mindset work, um, I would podcasting books, having mentors that have been in your shoes before and can help you navigate it. Is that something that you've done is hired mentors in the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this is actually why there's like a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs in that are involved in the like self-development and um, personal development world, because mm-hmm. we actually look at like, okay, well, what does this business need of me? And if I want to live the the good life, the proverbial good life, like how do I get there? And then we start investing in ourselves. That's how it happened for me. And most of the people that I meet when I'm doing that kind of work. Um, funny enough, I started just thinking I needed to produce more. (laughs) That was my very first investment was like high performance habits by Brennan Burchard, which is phenomenal. It's a great book, but I was like, yeah. And I think I took some coaching too. I was like, just tell me how to get more done in a day. And then I learned is like, actually, Stacey, this is before my little, you know, death and transformation in my business. But I was like, I'm just going to do more. I was like, you don't need to do more. You need to be a little bit different so that your business can do more. But like, you're, you're, you're tapped out. So let's let's calm down. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I invest myself. The other one thing that I really love to pass along to everybody that I talk to is like how I invest, because Mm. this is one thing that I see like a roller coaster, a huge roller coaster on right now. And it's like, people know that they need to do the mindset work. I'm seeing it online. We see it on Instagram. And then it's like, people invest big dollars. It's like $5,000 coaching program, $10,000 coaching program. Like this is going to solve all your issues. And it's like this huge investment, but mindset work is never ending, right? Mm. It like, we don't change our mindset overnight. It's the little pieces. It's the drip, drip, drip that adds to a, a lake. So I invest when I approach investing in mindset work, I look at financially how much I can afford. And I I look at it like it's, this is the long game. This is not the marathon. Like this is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm not investing really high ticket unless I really have the cash to do it. Because I I know that that like, I'm not going to go to a conference and be, I'm going to be changed a little bit. Doesn't matter how hard those like, or incredible those couple days are. The work is done afterwards and I'm going to have to invest a little bit more each day. And so that's where I I tend to look at books, I look at podcasts, I look at some courses, but I do, I'm not a huge fan of the like, okay, we're just going to like go and do this like huge program for like two months, it's going to change you forever. It's like, no, there's going to be a next investment. And if you can understand that, you'll make way better financial decisions. So I see people tapping themselves out having themselves out on like time and, you know, just financial investments in, in all of these. And I think you bring up such a great point, Stacey, is that it's, it never ends. If there's one thing that you could always invest in, I just had this conversation on another episode is yourself, whether it's your health, it's your mindset, like it it is just uh, therapy, like investing in yourself, you are your most important asset. And so whatever that looks like, realize that it's not over till it's over till it's the end for you. And so that mindset has to keep going. Anyone has always had some type of mentor. Now, do they have to be paid? No, they, they don't. It could be a, an old colleague that is maybe five years ahead of you that can help you navigate or a friend or just someone that you just meet online and can open up to. But that mindset work, I love that you talked about that investment never ends. And more often than not, and tell me if if I'm wrong, Stacey, I, I hear people talk about this is part of your like almost marketing business budget. This should be part of your business budget. Is that how yeah, you feel? I- 
Yeah, absolutely. I do think there there are ways where on any budget you can find what you're looking for. So if you have the budget, maybe you are, you know, spending a couple thousand dollars for a day of training, but um I don't think that's necessary. I think it it if anything, it's like I'm budgeting time towards it. Mm. Okay, cuz here's the other thing. So I own this other company. We haven't really talked about it, but it's called Love Powered Co. And we do affirmation cards for women and children. It's like a legacy play for my family. But one of the things that we know based on um, what we sell and the research that we've done is that anybody can have like this amazing morning routine, but there's going to be something that gets off track during the day. That's the way our brains are primed to see problems that might, might exist, right? So we're going to get off track. So no matter how great of a morning routine, like we pick an affirmation card and life's great, we still need an interruption in the middle of the day mm -hmm. to be like, hey, by the way, like, let's come back to center, let's meditate. So to me, it's investing the time. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily even the resources, it's the time. Like, maybe it is hiring an admin assistant so that in the middle of the day, you can do a five minute meditation, or you get that walk, but investing that way, versus like, you know, I wish Tony Robbins could download his brain into mine, but like, that's not happening. So, mm -hmm. so to me, it's about investing time instead of those big financial investments. I love that. I love that perspective. And I think that's what I, I would love everyone to take away from this is that it doesn't have to be black or white. It doesn't have to look like exactly what Shelly says or what Stacy says. It's what is your valuable asset, right? Like you, what, how are you going to invest in it? Is it time? Is it money? Is it, um, maybe it's extra sleep. Maybe it's eating lunch. Maybe it is eating lunch in your day. Those little investments into you can pay off huge dividends in the future and really gear you up for that mindset side of things. Now, you know, I know that you have, um, kind of three non-negotiables for successful business. Can you yeah. take us through those three as, as we're rounding out here? Okay. So I'm the money girl. Like, you know, a money is a pillar in business to me, money's opportunity. It provides resources to do the things that we want to do. If we're not even a nonprofit, I've worked with, um, almost a hundred nonprofits over the years and even they need to make money to be here tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, let's get past the idea that we don't need money. Yep. And what I do know is also like, if we're not making money as a business owner, if we're not getting paid what we're worth, then we're going to quit at some point. It may not be right away, but we're going to quit. So we have to make money and then we have to have an impact. So everybody thinks like, oh, here we go. Like this chick's talking about money. Like it's all dollar signs. It's like I'm Ebenezer Scrooge counting coins. Heck no. Um, we gave back hundreds of thousands in the few short years that I ran my business. And so impact is non-negotiable to me. Like we have to be client and customer focused. We have to be offering them something that they want and small businesses, like communities at the heart of it. So income impact, and then it's the life that we love. Like usually a lot of businesses can get those first two, like that, that equation's like easy enough, like, okay, we can balance these two. But when you add the third plate of like, hey, you also have to have a life, you can't be burning out, we have to be able to take care of our minds and our bodies and our families. That's usually where they're like, I don't know where, what I'm doing. And that's where like, then we start investing in like, okay, how can we have it all? But those are my non negotiables It's like, burnouts just it doesn't serve anybody. So mm -hmm. that's it. No, I love that. You know, and I think that that's just something that we can all take away is like, do we have non-negotiables, right? Are we flexing or maybe doing things that don't feel right, but we feel like obligated to do it, but it is cross, like crossing that value line for us. That could be, I know in my, in my corporate career, there were value lines crossed that ultimately was the end. Right. And so that can also come into running your own business or having certain people on your team or how you're spending money, investing time, all of it. So I love the fact that you have these non negotiables and um, just so nicely articulated them. Now, one last. Oh, did you have something to add? Well, yeah, I was going to say so, you know, something that really changed for me because I find a lot of time people are like, oh, I don't have time to do that or like, oh, I don't have time to think because I only know 
if something feels good or not, because I've actually given myself the time to think or at least mm. enough time to catch my thoughts. Okay. Cause they're yeah. happening anyways. Yeah. But then Tony Robin made this comment where it's like, so if you don't have 10 minutes a day, what kind of life are you living to say, I don't have 10 minutes to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that hit me like a brick wall. Um, and it was like, wow. Yeah. If I like, what kind of life is that? Is that something I want? So anybody who's about to say, like, hear the podcast and be like, oh yeah, that that's fine for you. But like, I don't have that time. It's like, if you don't, if you're telling me you don't have like five minutes or 10 minutes a day to like, you know, do something for yourself and, and think like, I really push on what kind of life are you living? And then what kind of changes you need to make? All right. Well, I, I mean, listen, we are no, no fluff, no BS. So I really love that. And sometimes we need to hear that, right? Mm -hmm. May not be what we want to hear, but it's what we need to hear. Now, my last question for you, Stacey, is when like looking back to when you left your CPA job, so not your business, but your job, what is something that surprised you when you first opened your business and became an entrepreneur? Oh, there's lots of surprises. Okay. I'm just going to like rapid fire them. Number one, I didn't really do marketing. My, my skill set in that area that led to all of my success is that I happened to know how to tell clients how I could benefit them, not the features of what I was going to do, but how I could change their lives. I don't know why that came naturally to me that led to so much success. I also, um, because I was pretty good at understanding myself, I learned very quickly about like my nervous system and how I reacted. And that was a game changer mm -hmm. in business. Mm -hmm. And then I came in with the understanding that like every problem's probably on me, but every solution is also. And that also was a thing where it was like, that really came true very quickly for me. Um, I had to figure that out fast. I really love that because, you know, as business owners, we can just like literally be putting fires out all day long. I remember like coming home from a business that we had that it, literally all day, I'd be like, I just put out fires and I had to reframe it to what you just said. I literally solved so many great things today. Like, and, it, and it's the words that we use and the way that we describe it. Right. So not only are you a problem solver, you're a solution finder, but also like, you know, we were talking about scaling businesses and. Um, so not only it's like, okay, like I, I'm a solution finder, but also it's like, what kind of environment am I creating that it's always mm -hmm. fires? Mm -hmm. It's like, how do we mm -hmm. get past the always fires? Like, is this our mindset just to see it this way? Are these actually emergencies? Can we train our clients and customers differently? Like there's so much opportunity as soon as you just think to yourself, like, Hey, it doesn't have to be chaos. And that was a mindset shift right? Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. a mindset shift. It wasn't necessarily a business shift. That was a mindset shift. I the mindset just leads to the strategy, right? Like you learn mm -hmm. the mindset of like, Hey, I want to see this differently. And then that like, now what do I need to do differently? I need to think differently. And I also need to act differently. The action that follows. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stacey, I absolutely loved our time together today. Um, before we sign off here, how can everyone find you? What is the best way to get in contact with you? Not only to learn more, but just to watch everything great that you're putting out. Yeah. The easiest way is Instagram. I'm Stacy S T A C I dot Millard. Um, and also the school for small business podcast where they can catch our episode. Yes, absolutely. So I will tag everything in the show notes. Absolutely. So make sure that you follow Stacy and listen to her podcast. These are just such great like pieces of, of wisdom and the way that you interview is fire. So I just wanted to thank you for having me on and encourage all of our listeners to go over there, the school of, of business, of small business, excuse me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Thank you. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. I love our conversations, Shelly. I know it's really fun. Like I'm, I, our conversations, I'm like, I want to go this way, this way. And I'm like, nope, what do our listeners need? I'm going to, I'm going to steer and get this wisdom out of Stacy. So thank you so much, Stacy, And, um, we will be seeing you soon.